So here I have Cooney, who's going to teach us how to do a physical exam on a snake. You actually can do a lot on your physical exam on a snake, um, more than you would think. Um, and so I just kind of want to run through uh, what all we can do. So I always typically look um, first at their body condition. So you're going to try to get her to go out. And then you're going to feel the spine. And on either side of the spine, um, the muscles should just kind of like go down like this. It shouldn't bulge up like this. She's in moderate body condition. <laughs> she has a little bit of a bulge you can see here, but honestly, it's not so bad. She's actually pretty good. Um, really fat snakes, they'll have like cleavage like from their spine and their body because of the fat. The other way you can tell is the tail. So um, her tail is just like a really like nice streamlined um, shape, but uh, really fat snakes will be like really fat here and then it'll like kind of taper down. Um, so she's a bob python, so they naturally have these little um, claws, they're called vestigial thorns, um, that's used for copulation, which that's completely normal for her to have those. Um, so next what I do is I do palpate their abdomen. So a snake like her size, I actually do get a holder to like take the weight off of the front half. And then I kind of give a little tension, so hold me, hold me back. And then what I'm doing with my tension is I'm kind of pulling her out and then I'm, you can see I'm, I'm not being rough, but I'm, I'm, you know, really trying to palpate her abdomen. What I'm trying to feel is anything slip between my fingers, um, like a mass or something. Um, you can also appreciate GI gas, like you'll hear it like, like through your fingers as you're like milking through. I just palpate, palpate, palpate. Very good. She has a poopy here, but that's pretty normal. Completely good. Wow, she looks great. I also look at the scales. The scales should not be damaged. Um, they should be, you know, perfectly in line with each other. They should also not have excessive shed on them. Um, so snakes shed in one giant long piece. They don't shed in patches like lizards do. So if you see patches of, of um, retained shed, then there's an issue with their husbandry, whether it's humidity or temperatures or um, the snake's just sick. Um, but if you're seeing shed on the snake, that's not normal. They're actually really soft. So they should feel just really nice and smooth and soft. Um, same thing with her belly. Her belly should be the same color um, uniformly throughout. Um, hers is nice because it's white, um, but if you see any redness or pinkness to the abdomen, um, it, could be, it could be abnormal. But hers is perfect. Good job. The most common reason snakes present to the veterinary hospital is directly related to their husbandry. So often enough, snakes aren't kept hot enough or they're not kept at the right humidity, they're not fed the proper diets, um, they're, they're just not cared for adequately. Um, so thankfully, as a veterinarian, you're able to provide that education and really make the life of this animal tremendously better and prevent it from illnesses. So I do take their heart rate. Unfortunately, you can't really auscultate them. So I use a Doppler to be able to take the heart rate. So where is the heart in a snake is kind of a, you know, age old question. So what I do is I will stare at the snake and you can see the scales move. So that's where my heart is. I actually probably could count it. Smaller snakes, you can't. But I'll go ahead and use the Doppler. A little bit at jail to listen and to get our heart rate. Pretty normal, a little fast, but you know, she's at the hospital all day, so <laughs> probably normal for her today. It sounds pretty good. Obviously, you're going to be looking for, you know, abnormally really low heart rates or really fast heart rates. Um, the next thing I do is I look at their face. And the reason why, so I feel like most of my physical exams I start with the face, but with snakes I always do the face last because they um, hate it. They hate their face being touched. Cooney is actually trained where she is used to her head being touched, um, but that's not most, most snakes at all. So what I'm looking, um, she's a ball python, uh, so I'm looking to make sure her pits look good. Not all snakes will have that. Um, I'm also watching her tongue flicks, making sure that they're regular um, and that they're happening. You know, a snake that's not tongue flicking is actually really, really sick. Um, so she's been doing it the whole time. There she goes. I'm also looking at her eyes. They do not have eyelids. Um, 
so they have these really thick spectacles over their eyes to protect them. Um, it's a scale. You can think of it like that, the spectacle. So when I'm looking at the eyes, um, sometimes they will have the spectacle either retained or still left to shut off. Um, and what that will look like was like a little blue haze or it might look uh, thicker or even wrinkled. Um, Cooney doesn't have that at all. Her eyes look absolutely perfect. I'm also looking at her little tiny nostrils. They're right here. You do um, sometimes get nasal discharge and stinks. So I always look at that um, to make sure that those are nice and clear. And then I look at her mouth. Um, so whenever you look in the mouth of a snake, um, there's a couple things. They do have teeth, um, a lot of teeth, and they fall out and they grow back, um, but they're really delicate, these teeth. Um, so I use a really flexible plastic spatula in order to look at their mouth so that way they don't, I don't break any teeth or I don't like hurt their mouth when I'm trying to take a look. Um, I know other vets use credit cards or guitar picks. Um, I just like the spatula because I try to be kind and not hurt them. Uh, when I look in the mouth, what I'm looking for is excessive spit in the back of the throat would not be normal. Um, I'm looking for nice bright pink mucous membranes. Um, and then I'm actually going to take the time to wait for her glottis to open. Snakes don't have an epiglottis, so it's awesome. You can pretty much see just directly into her trachea, but I wanna make sure that's clear and clean whenever I look in their mouth. So I always have someone restrain the body. And then I'm going to do the head. And then I kind of just start, how I do it, I actually kick my thumb and I kind of like, ooh, like crack their, like their little mouth. So that way, I'm, again, I'm not shoving this in. And then I just kind of gently put this in. Her mouth is nice and beautiful. I do look at the roof of the mouth to look at the coena. Make sure that's also nice and clear in the bottom. And if you focus in on the base of her tongue, we're gonna wait for that trachea to open up. There she goes, beautiful open trachea. There it is, now she closed it. In general, reptiles have a really hard time because their owners just aren't educated enough to take care of them. Um, reptiles must live at their pots, which means the preferred optimal temperature zone for the species that they are. So it's completely species dependent and it has to do with the region of the world they're in. So without their pots, they can't be them. They can't have a normal physiology. They can't have a normal metabolism. They can't digest their food properly. They can't thrive. So that alone is extraordinarily important to the care of reptiles. The other side of that is another type of element that you're gonna add, which is UVB. UVB light is needed by every living creature. So what UVB light is, is it's um, rays from the sun, or in our case, we're using artificial lights, given to the reptile. Again, it's really species specific. So the bearded dragon that's in the direct sun all day is going to need a lot more UVB than the crepuscular leopard gecko. So it's really important that we research the species because not only the output of UVB, but the distance it needs to be away from the animal is completely dictated by what type of light you have, so how much it's emitting, and also the species. So whenever you have a reptile, definitely look into what their specific needs are in order to provide them with the care they need to thrive. It's not always important to sex the snake, um, but I think it's really important when you're, when you're trying to evaluate blood work um, and also um, when you're um, wanting to know, you know, different pathologies that happen, you know, in different sexes. And so how to sex a snake, um, you cannot tell by looking at them. Um, you um, do it based upon the depth um, that goes down in the cloaca. So what happens is males, they don't have a penis, they have what's called hemipenes. Um, and their hemipenes are two little copulatory organs. They're not connected to the urinary tract, they're just for disseminating sperm. And what the hemipenes do is they come out and they'll go into the cloaca of the female when, um, when they're mating. Um, and then the hemipenes are housed in this little um, area that's at the base of the tail. So when you're sexing a snake, what you're doing is you're probing that hemipene home, if you will, um, to see um, you know, what kind of space is available. If it's a female, the space is really short because they don't have hemipenes, so they don't need that like little house for the hemipene to live in. If it's a male, your probe will like go in pretty far. So you usually need a kit because different size probes are for different animals. 
You obviously don't want to use a really small probe on a really big snake because you can perforate something, you can hurt him. So I try to use the probe that's, um, you know, not too small, not too big, um, based upon just looking at the cloaca. So I have my lubed probe, and what I do is I actually go forward and then backwards because it doesn't really fit backwards all the time. So I'll kind of go a little bit forwards and then it kind of gets me into the space. You're gonna go on the lateral aspect of the vent and you're just gonna push down. My probe stopped there. And you can do it on both sides to just like double check yourself. Forward, down, so there is a pocket, but it's a female. If this was a male, it would have gone to there. Venipuncture in a snake classically has been done for years and years via intracardiac sticks. I really avoid doing those for the obvious reason, you're stabbing the heart to get blood. Um, and so I found that most snakes, you can actually accomplish a venipuncture from the caudal tail vein. Um, they have this little trick where if you count six scales from the cloaca, um, that's the best venipuncture site. Um, so I try to go there if my stick's big enough. Um, if you go too close to the cloaca, they have these scent glands and you accidentally might hit the scent gland. So if you see like yellowy, off-white in your syringe, just stop. You hit the scent gland, you didn't get the blood, um, and try again a little bit more distal down the tail. Um, but again, with a lot of patience um, and, and practice, you can, you can do a pretty good venipuncture on the tail of a snake.